On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to Life Science Success Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don, and I'm a consultant in life sciences, and I help companies overall with process improvement and implementing new technologies, as well as, as things like project management and things like that inside of life sciences. Um, today, actually, we have a very exciting guest. Um, my guest is Matt Hill. Matt is the founder and CEO of Elgin Corporation, privately held company in the San Francisco Bay Area, committed to revolutionizing synthetic bi biology workflows with innovative DNA writing technology. And uh, so with that, welcome, Matt. Thanks. Thanks so much, Don. Really pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot for being here. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, if would you just take a moment and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, so currently CEO and founder of, of Elegen, uh, a company that I've been involved with, started uh, back in uh, 2017 uh, and have been uh, leading ever since. Um, I guess my sort of short history here is uh, I have a PhD in genetics, uh, did that at Stanford here in California. Uh, actually came out to the Bay Area originally and, and Stanford in particular uh, because I was very interested in startups uh, e even before going to graduate school. Uh, I thought it was a very good uh, ecosystem to, uh, to put myself into uh, while, I, while, I, while I pursued that graduate degree. Uh, and then uh, after my PhD was finished, I actually went into the startup world. I joined a fledgling company at the time called Deterra. Uh, Natera is currently one of the leading molecular diagnostics companies. Um, and so I joined a, a, that company uh, back in around 2009. It was a fledgling company that had one uh, initial product in the market. Uh, and I joined a very small uh, biology team to help them build out new products and new capabilities. Um, and, go ahead. Yeah. And then I was going to ask, so then what made you want to go from that to, um, you know, more the R&D, you know, sort of the development of the product side over to now being a CEO and founder? Um, yeah, I am, uh, I guess I'm a consummate builder. I, I really, uh, or maker perhaps. Uh, I just, I love sort of connecting dots across different technology areas. Uh, I love trying to find, you know, I'm, I'm that guy who's sort of, if you, if you complain to me about a problem, I'm, I'm the guy who tries to immediately start troubleshooting it for you. I tend to bring that to my own work uh, pretty frequently. Uh, and so, you know, as I was uh, leading the R&D team over at Natera, you know, there's just a handful of different areas that I got really intrigued about uh, and, and, and could see potential new solutions to those problems. Uh, one of those was actually in the production of DNA. Uh, and, and it hit us in a couple of different fronts uh, at Natera. Uh, you know, one of the key technology platforms that I uh, helped create with my team over there was a massively multiplex PCR technology. Uh, and that's, a, you know, effectively a 20,000 plex PCR reaction in a single tube that allows Natera to collect exquisitely rich and uh, precise data uh, about what's happening. Uh, in at least uh, the initial product there was non-invasive prenatal testing. So uh, rich, very, very rich, very precise data on uh, what's, uh, you know, the sort of the genetic state of an unborn uh, of an unborn child. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a, it, it was a very exciting opportunity to sort of build out a new technology platform while there. Uh, but one of the things that I encountered was, you know, just getting DNA to actually allow us to iterate and experiment on that technology platform, uh, was a, one of the important bottlenecks in our process. Um, we were ordering very, very large collections of oligos in order to do a very large multiplex uh, uh, primer approach. Uh, and there was a pretty substantial latency in those. So it was, you know, maybe one of the first times I recognized that DNA uh, synthesis and DNA production itself is still a major bottleneck, a major hurdle in this ecosystem. And it was slowing us down. And, and, and when you take a step back and look at what's going across 
uh, or going on in this entire ecosystem, it's slowing down every life science company on every, almost every project they're doing. Uh, DNA is such a foundational input into every product that gets developed, whether you're talking about therapeutics or ag bio or syn bio, DNA is the starting point for many of those projects. And that's a problem that, uh, that just needed to be solved. Um, the technologies uh, for the audience, if they're not familiar, the technologies that are involved in the production of DNA uh, are fairly complex. And many of those technologies are decades old. Um, it, you know, it turns out to be a multi-step manufacturing process. Most people think of it as DNA, you know, quote unquote, DNA synthesis, but the actual production of, of DNA for uh, or longer double-stranded DNA for rewriting genomes, re-engineering cells, uh, reprogramming cells is actually this double-stranded DNA, which has multiple steps involved in its production. And, and I'm happy to get into that at the right point. Yeah, that'd be great. The, um, yeah, as my, where my mind went to is that, I mean, diagnostic companies, I would imagine like Natera, over a period of time build uh, just an immense um it seems like a uh, tissue bank <laughs> and for the things that they, you know, continue to, to examine uh, throughout time. And, and so, yeah, I, I definitely am, am interested in hearing how this, this plays a role um, for companies that are developing diagnostics um, because I, I have seen it myself, you know, somebody, a client will come in and they'll say, you know, we would like, um, you know, to develop a companion diagnostic for a client um, that has this type of uh, structure, you know, this type of patient, uh, you know, structure. And um, then you're off, you know, searching for those types of, you know, oftentimes, you know, tissue samples and, and other things to try and, you know, make sure that you accurately target the diagnostic for the thing that, that you're looking for. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've personally seen how it can slow down diagnostic companies in our space as well. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. That DNA, it's just, it's, again, it's so fundamental uh, to everything that we do. And as I said, you know, the, the tech employed for creating that DNA is, is decades old, um, you know, especially because there are multiple steps involved. There's been, you know, of course, there's been some innovation uh, on different aspects of that process. Uh, you know, there's, you know, the three fundamental pillars for, for, for you and the audience, uh, you know, if you're making longer double-stranded DNA, um, I think everybody's sort of intuitively familiar. If you, if you do biology at all, you're intuitively familiar with primers and probes and oligos and that sort of thing. That's actually the starting point, but it's not the ending, uh, the, the end point for making double-stranded longer DNA that you might use to reprogram a cell. Uh, so you, you make oligo, oligos first, which is the true synthetic step that's nucleotides to oligos. But then when you, uh, if you want to make longer double-stranded DNA, you actually have to take those oligos and you have to assemble them together into longer double-stranded fragments. And you leverage the hybridization of, of oligos, uh, of overlapping oligos to achieve that. Um, and then there's a third step in that process, which is purification. Uh, we, in the field, know it as cloning. And, mm. and but cloning is really just a purification procedure. When you do that, that, that oligo synthesis step followed by the assembly step, you inevitably end up with errors, uh, molecules that contain errors. Some of the molecules in that tube might be perfect, but a, a large number of, a large fraction of them actually contain errors. And what we all call traditional cloning is a, is a means of basically partitioning those molecules into cells and each cell, each transformation event picked up by E. coli. So you, you put a fragment into an E. coli vector backbone, plasma, plasma backbone, and then you electroporate it into an E. coli cell. You put those onto an agar plate with an antibiotic resistance marker, and that allows you to identify single instances or single molecular species. Uh, and you leverage the cell, the E. coli cell, of course, itself to replicate the DNA to produce enough material that you can take it downstream and test and maybe do some sequencing or run some gels. Um, but you've got these three fundamental steps of synthesis assembly and then purification. And the cloning step has remained unchanged. I mean, strictly speaking, unchanged since it was invented in the, er, invented in the early uh, 1970s. So we're really talking about technology that is many decades old. Uh, there are challenges at the assembly step uh, that, that, uh, that limit the types and complexity of DNA that you can create. And then there's also 
some pretty fundamental challenges at the oligosynthesis step that relate uh, in, in many ways to the throughput and the cost of making uh, such a wide variety of those oligos to feed downstream gene production. So you've really got three fundamental problems that you need to solve. And that, you know, that sort of notion was the starting point and the, and the origin for Allergen. Very interesting. So at Elgin, you have a product called Infinia DNA. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this technology is revolutionizing synthetic biology workflows? Yeah, our, our vision with Infinia was to uh, allow customers, and, you know, researchers and scientists in the, in the life sciences to uh, streamline their workflows. I mean, you know, I, I think there was a mantra over the last handful of years around you know, engineering biology with rapid design, build, test, learn, right? Um, you want to be able to execute uh, that flywheel as fast as possible because we don't necessarily, you know, biology has got a lot of unknowns. We don't necessarily know the operating characteristics of a system that we're trying to engineer. Uh, you've got to take a lot of shots on goals, goal rather, and you, you want to do that as quickly as possible so you can learn with each iterative cycle. Uh, it's, it, it's the rapid prototyping uh, notion that we have in many other fields. Uh, right. You know, uh, engineering has been using this for many, many decades, of course, and we're trying to bring that to biology. And you've got to be able to actually rapidly make the DNA, which is the software for a cell. You've got to be able to make that DNA, reprogram and get it into a cell, reprogram it quickly, take your measurements, and then in many cases, iterate very, very quickly. And so that capability just didn't exist. And so our vision with Infinia DNA is that we streamline that process. We make very, you know, DNA up to 7,000 bases today. We can deliver that in as little as six business days. Uh, and we can do that with greater complexity and effectively clonal accuracy. Uh, and we can get that into customers' hands very, very quickly and allow them to do more uh, faster. So uh, do more interesting science, gain more insights and then turn the crank and iterate faster to build better products. So could you give us some, some real world examples of the applications of the products? Uh, yeah, I have to be careful not to share customer, uh, customer information, sure. but um, you know, we've got a number of customers in the therapeutics realm uh, exploring different sequences. Uh, you know, we've got quite a few customers across the mRNA therapeutics world, for example, uh, who are testing out a variety of different um, uh, different targets, different promoters, different terminators, trying to optimize their expression of their targets. Uh, you know, they're, they're iterating through a number of different molecules to optimize their therapeutic, their downstream therapeutic uh, benefit. And then um, as you, as you look across the different industries that, that you touch, is there, um, is there one primary industry that you currently work in or is it, you know, across everything that, that we've talked about before? Because we had talked about, um, you know, sort of the like agro side, uh, healthcare and pharmaceuticals. So just curious, you know, if, if there's one industry that really stands out and then, you know, also kind of how they're ranked. Well, we think there's impact across of our product and, our, and our, both our current and our future product offerings across the entire ecosystem that is, you know, therapeutics and ag and SynBio. Um, we have customers across all three of those broad areas. Uh, one of the areas of greatest uptake, initial uptake is in fact in the, in the therapeutics realm. Um, that's probably somewhat driven by the fact that customers are uh, perhaps most eager to move very, very quickly. Time is time is money. And when you're talking about a therapeutic time, it potentially equals a lot of money uh, and the ability to get the long, you know, clonal or perfect fragments or uh, strands of DNA that you need to execute your, your analytics is absolutely essential to some of those programs. So the ability for them to move fast is, is critical. And so we're seeing a lot of very rapid uptake in that, in that area. And then um, in what ways does, does your technology contribute to the advancement of the bioeconomy as well? Oh, uh, I like to think it's, it's foundational. Uh, I mean, this is the, uh, you, you know, we are, we are uh, an accelerant in that flywheel and we accelerate this, the rate at which 
new companies, existing companies can discover new products, develop new products. And uh, for me, this is the most exciting part of it is that, uh, you know, we are really, we view ourselves as, as you know, really enabling to this whole ecosystem and the faster they can develop products that actually work. Uh, it's a very interesting thing, actually, in the biological sciences, the typical development cycle for a lot of products is six to nine months. Uh, you, you typically have about that long, you know, you've got some corporate mandate, executive, you know, senior executive mandate to do something, to solve some problem. And the way it historically works, you've got, you perhaps have a couple of ideas of how to address a particular problem uh, at the biological level. Uh, and then you'll try and instantiate those and, and make it work. And you've got really one, two, maybe three shots on goal mm. uh, to make progress, to show definitive results. Uh, uh, we call it feasibility where I come from, you know, did your you know, if you're developing a diagnostic, you want to get to a point where you can show that your particular approach actually yields results that suggest a particular diagnostic approach might work. Uh, you've got six to nine months to show that uh, before decisions are made about whether to continue or stop a project. What we want to do is enable the world to, to, to see, you know, six, seven, eight shots on goal in that same time period. Um, and, and, and being able to supply the DNA that lets you take those shots and go instead of waiting, you know, six, eight, sometimes 12 weeks, especially if the DNA is long or complex, instead of waiting that kind of time frame to then finally get your DNA into a cell and take your measurements and get a result and evaluate the result. We want it, We want the entire ecosystem being able to do this on the order of a week or two, as opposed to a couple of months. And that, I think that totally and completely shifts the paradigm of the types of products and types of solutions we can create in, in, in the life sciences. I mean, to me, this really underpins this entire world, this entire future of biological engineering or programmable biology. It is the thing that a lot of the uh, key opinion leaders uh, started talking about in the early 2000s. We just didn't have the technology to get us there. Right. Yeah. And I, it's interesting because I, you, you'd love for a lot in a lot of these cases for the, you know, the drug discovery to be accelerated. You'd like for the, you know, kind of final product development to be accelerated. But oftentimes we, we're so challenged with, you know, the availability of, of information to be able to confirm, you know, the thing that we've, that we've developed, whether, whether or not if it's ready you know, to move to that next step. And it sounds to me like um, this will be a big accelerant for, uh, for that in the future as well. Yeah. And or look, and you know, it's, it's not just speed, but it's also scalability and to some extent cost. Uh, our technology allows groups to cast a very wide net right up front, mm -hmm. uh, measure, take a lot of different measurements, look at a lot of different options for the sequence, uh, call again, call it promoters, terminators, a variety, you know, variants, variant libraries. Uh, these are all things we can do and allow groups to cast a very wide net uh, take that data, model it, understand it. Um, obviously, there's a very exciting intersection now emerging around bio and AI, which is you know uh, really starting to take off. Um, and I think you know the uh, the ability to look and look at and collect a lot of data is going to be the driving force behind AI because you can't model, you can't build AI models without the data in the first place. Uh, and then you want to be able to generate more data that feeds back into your AI, AI models that you can improve those models and get better and better with each turn. Well, interestingly enough as well, the timing of, of our interview coincides with a big press release that, uh, that you just had today uh, earlier. So uh, would you mind just sharing with the listeners a little bit about uh, you know, what's happening right now with Elegant? Absolutely. And thanks for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to share this. Uh, sure. So we're excited to announce that uh, here at Elegen that we just closed a partnership and agreement with uh, GSK. Uh, we're very excited to announce this. It is, uh, it is a $35 million opportunity for us, um, and it supports us in, an, in a number of ways uh, with upfronts, uh, equity investment, and then milestones upon achieving certain uh, technical objectives that they're, they're, that they're interested in. 
So yeah, so very, I mean, it, it's got to be got to be just a tremendous day for the for the entire company uh, as well to just uh, see that all of the hard work that you put in, you know, sort of you know resulted in this in this uh, milestone as well. Absolutely, and we're we're very I'm very proud of the team. The team's been working exceptionally hard across the board uh, to get us to get us uh, where we are in terms of the state of the technology. Uh, and then, of course, it's incredibly validating to have this recognition from uh, a partner like GSK and, and uh, validates everything we've built and validates the, the vector that we're on as a company. So my last few questions really are going to focus more on you uh, overall as an individual and as a leader. Um, the first one is, what's the greatest leadership advice that you've ever received and how has it uh, you know, really impacted the approach that you're taking as a founder and CEO? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if I have a specific uh, piece of advice, but uh, I, I've learned by watching, uh, you know, both at my previous company, Natera, um, you know, really amazing team there. Uh, I mean, really, really just tremendous team, brilliant folks. Um, and I think, you know, the ecosystem of innovation that that team created is something that still inspires me today. Uh, and I've tried to replicate that here at Elegen. I think uh, the idea is, you know, we do things, I, I'm inspired personally by doing things with impact mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, touching human lives and, 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 and really wanting to help people. Uh, and then of course, you know, folks like myself, and I'm sure many of your listeners, we went into science because that's also right. our potential, our, our technical strengths, our abilities. Uh, and so it's this overlap of it's, uh, it's what we like to do. It's what we're good at. And it has a lot of impact. And, and so I've tried to bring that to Elegen. I try to inspire and encourage my team and foster that in our, uh, at our company. Uh, and I try to bring in um, people who believe and live that sort of ethos every day. And I think that has a, has sort of a very virtuistic flywheel uh, in that I think everybody really enjoys their work and they like working uh, on the very important problems that we are working on. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's interesting because whenever you sort of look from the, the outside perspective, I, th I feel like there are people that, that sort of, think about the profits and things like that, that companies generate and sort of, you know, spin this into, oh, well, that's why they got into this. But whenever you talk to so many people, it's no, we started with the patients and, you know, we're very focused on improving lives. And, and you know, yes, there are profitable companies in life sciences, but I, I very seldom will run into somebody that starts, you know, starts out with the, you know, hey, I got into this because I was thinking I was getting into the you know, the oil industry or the energy industry or, you know, some other industry where I knew I would make a lot of money. Um, you know, instead, um, people, you know, I feel like in our space very much do want to transform, you know, the lives with the things that they're bringing to market. And so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I, I think, you know, we, many of us could have in this field could have gone on to do things, you know, in the energy sector or the finance sector. And we elected to do the things that we do because we love it, because we uh, were inspired by it, and we love the potential impact that it has on the world around us and, and in many ways, a very positive way. Uh, and I think, um, you know, of course, any company has to be profit seeking. There's, there's no doubt you can't you can't circumvent that. But I would I view the profit seeking as a barometer that you're working on an important problem because important problems have value when you have a good solution. And so that profit seeking becomes a barometer for what you should be working on. And there's no misalignment. Uh, we get to make money for our investors and we get to come to work every day and have a, and, and make a real impact on the world. Such an important point. Thank you for sharing. Next question is what inspires you? Um, I, I think in many ways, I hate to refer to my last answer, but I, again, I think, it is this notion of having a real impact in the world and being able to do things that change people's lives. Uh, and so I always, uh, maybe to just continue the thought at least, is I always look for 
Um, you know, I enjoy solving hard problems, but I'm always looking for problems that I think do have a very specific, specific impact that you can point to. And, you know, when we talk about Infinia DNA and the, and the technologies that Elegen has developed, you know, these are uh, our customers are in the therapeutic realm and, and, and these uh, these pharma companies like GSK and others are developing treatments and therapies that directly impact people's lives. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, our technology could feed into the next COVID vaccine, for example, or personalized therapeutics, which are you know, going to be addressing some of the longstanding biggest challenges that we face, like cancer. Right. Uh, and, and to know that Elegance technology could be absolutely enabling to that solution, to a category of therapies that allow us to you know, really improve patient lives who have cancer, who've had cancer. Uh, I mean, you've, sir, you've seen, I'm sure your audience, many of the members have seen uh, the recent Moderna data. I mean, that's very inspiring um, in terms of the success that they're seeing with their combined uh, uh, oncology therapy mm -hmm. in melanoma. So uh, we're very excited to see that develop. And we would, of course, as a company, like to see uh, become part of that solution as well. Very good. What concerns you? Um, I actually am quite frustrated personally by the, uh, by the gap in, in, uh, funding for deep innovation in the life sciences. So it's, it, so the concern is that we're just not doing this at the rate and, and the depth that we need to, uh, to support, um, you know, ongoing foundational innovation in the life sciences. And, and what I mean by that specifically is th there's a pretty sizable gap uh, out there in the ecosystem around getting enough capital in to uh, develop novel technical solutions, novel biological solutions to foundational problems. Um, for example, the SBIR world, the grant world, uh, those grants, uh, uh, many of your listeners may experience, they're very hard to get. And, and the amount of money actually and capital available in those grants is, is typically pretty small. And the biological, the biological sciences is a very expensive field to operate in. Uh, and so that money doesn't take you very far. Uh, and then, of course, the venture community uh, wants solutions that work, demonstrably work. And so there exists a gap. In, in funding foundational research and development that I don't, that we need to actually work to close. So I'm concerned that we're not doing enough. Uh, there needs to be more grant opportunities. The grants need to be much larger. Um, I think it's a real problem and we've got to figure out how to solve it. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree at all. I mean, yesterday, the last year, especially, I mean, we, we heard routinely from companies that had you know, great products, great results, you know, we're, we're at a point, a pivot point for the or overall organization. And either they couldn't continue and they had to shelve things until they could, you know, maybe come back at some point this year. Or, um, you know, there were certainly companies that just didn't survive. I, and, um, you know, I, you know, if you think of mainstream um, companies that are researching, you know, things like cancer drugs and things like that, where those companies seem to have an easier path, um, you know, to, to find a solution. But if you're a company that develops, a, I don't know, some form of treatment for an eye disease or a CNF disease, you know, those things just are not um, uh, as, as well funded. I, I feel in, like in the same, the same, you know, camp that you are that, you know, one, at some point, any one of us could need, you know, any of these things. And yet the, if, if, the very few dollars are only going to one area. It really, it really makes it tough for those other things to try and survive. And so I know that the entrepreneurs are trying to be extremely creative and I've heard of a lot of great solutions for, you know, to at least attempt to try and find funding, but it is a, a very tough environment. It is indeed. It is indeed. Okay. Last question. What excites you? Um, I think coming back to the AI uh, part of this story, uh, you know, as Again, as Elgin deploys this capability that allows you to turn that flywheel very quickly, uh, I think the emergence of AI and that intersection between AI and bio is going to result in uh, a world that I think is 
it's somewhat unrecognizable in a very short period of time. Um, I mean, this is really an opportunity to, uh, you know, build and design things at the biological level that I don't think we've ever had any notion how to do. And AI is going to drive a lot of that. And of course, Elegen's here to, uh, to make the DNA that's going to be required to actually reprogram the cells themselves. So you'll, you might have uh, models and predictions uh, generated by an AI model, but then you actually have to go and construct it. And that's where we come in. So I think it's going to be uh, mutually uh, synergistic. I do look forward to hearing um, hearing the scientist in the future sort of criticize the output of the model and in both ways, right? One, you know, sort of the, you know, hey, look, this helped us, you know, see a little clearer path that maybe we didn't see. Um, but also, I, I, you know, if you look at what the, I'll put a chat GPT as an example, if I asked it to write a, an, an article you know, for me, um, you know, I may criticize certain elements of that and think that it should be done differently. Um, whenever it comes down to the base science and the decisions that we're making, it'll be interesting to see if there's a, if there's a logical sort of disconnect that, that maybe would have led us in a different direction, um, you know, with the solution and whether that, mat, you know, eventually matches, you know, kind of where the endpoint needed to be or if um, there's still a disconnect at the, at the end point as well. I, I'm hearing you know, a lot of great things in terms of in silico research that's, that's ongoing and um, you know, certainly you know, a lot of benefits to AI. I just, I really sort of question that future and you know, in, in what the output of the scientists and the, the developers will be uh, whenever you know, they go back and look at the models. I, I th yeah, I, I mean, I see what you're saying. I, I think the, the powerful thing about these AI models are that they, they, they're frankly just, I mean, they're smarter than us. They can, uh, if you feed them the right data, uh, they can traverse that data and make connections in that data that I think is very hard for humans to do. And, uh, while, you know, the data isn't quite there for the called the biological sciences, uh, a lot of scientists are going to be pursuing this very quickly and we're going to start populating that space. I think, um, you know, just just imagine a, a chat GPT built on top of uh, all existing available journal literature, which right. was not incorporated into the into the chat GPT, the original chat GPT models. Uh, and, and then imagining imagine when you're, you know, you have some biological question You've got a supercomputer that can synthesize across all of that journal literature rather than you reading dozens and dozens and dozens of articles, review articles and, 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 and primary articles and trying to synthesize that all, all yourself. You've got this, uh, you know, this AI system that can, you've still got to prompt it. You've still got to ask the right questions, but then it becomes an iterative process between uh, a Q&A process that advances you through your thinking and, you know, uh, fingers crossed you're getting reasonably accurate responses. And to the extent that you're not getting reasonable accurate responses uh, over the next few years, people will be adding more data to these systems and rebuilding the model. And you've got this uh, ratcheting, uh, very quickly ratcheting improvement in the models. So uh, I'm excited to see what, what comes out of this. Yeah, I, I am too. I am as well. Well, Matthew Hill, thank you so much for joining the Life Science Success Podcast, and thank you for telling us about Elegen and the great work that's going on there. Congratulations, by the way, to you and the team uh, as well on your, your recent relationship, and uh, I wish you success in the future. Thanks you so, thank you so much, Don. Really appreciate it, and we all thank you here. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again.